We, this is typically what would be called Palm Sunday. It probably isn't a typical Palm Sunday message, but I think it fits. Extravagant love. And I gave a little piece of paper out this morning, or Kurt did it for me, thank you. And so that will, I want you to picture that. I don't want you to fill it out now. I want you to fill it out at the end of the message as we look at what does it mean to extravagantly love Jesus in these three ways. We're going to be looking at the context, though. We're going to look at chapter 11 when we get started here, and we're going to just see what things are going on. Remember last week when we were together, we talked about uh, the raising of Lazarus, how Jesus actually waited before he came, and then he rose Lazarus from the dead, and how he, he wept. He said he had compassion for them. It really hurt him to see the people that he loved in pain. And how that we even said that that's kind of like us. He sees our pain and he cares. And he has compassion for us. And he saw the pain that they were going through. Well, right after that is where we're going to be coming to this morning. And the events that will be happening immediately following uh, the raising of Lazarus. And remember, he had two sisters called Mary and Martha. And he, and he was very close to that whole family. So why don't we go to the Lord in prayer to ask him to guide us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is real and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank you, Lord, that the, your word is relevant for us even today, even 2,000 years after it was written, because you wrote it in such a way to encourage us to come to you no matter what time period we lived in, because you are the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Guide us through your word this morning. Help us to see a picture of extravagant love and be able to challenge ourselves, is that us? In Jesus' name, amen. So context, we're going to read through a few verses here to get the context um, of what happened right after Jesus raised Lazarus. Start with verse 37. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place, they were too concerned about losing their position, and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into an account that it is expedient for one man to die for the people, and that the whole nation not perish. Now we did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied with, that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. Therefore, Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. So they were seeking for Jesus and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? That he will come to the feast at all? That he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so they might seize him. So the context. They just had the healing of Lazarus in Bethany, which was a couple miles out of Jerusalem. And now he'd gone to another place. He stopped ministering publicly after he healed Lazarus, brought him back from the dead. And he spent time just with his disciples in, um, I think it says where it is, I lost it off my mind. Oh, I turned the page. Um, but he went to another place, and, and anyways, uh, spent time with his disciples, teaching them, just spending time with them. But now, it's six days before the Passover, and he comes back to Bethany, not to Jerusalem yet, um, but he comes back to Bethany. Now, what's going on, though, is that uh, six days before, or a week before, we could say, um, the Passover, which was one of those times where all Jews were supposed to come back to Jerusalem to pay homage to God, to worship Him. Um, many would come a week early, or days earlier, depending on who it was and if they had the time, um, they would come earlier to purify themselves, to get them ready for the week later to um, do the Passover. So in the midst of this, you just picture Jerusalem, it's growing. There's more and more people showing up. 
There's more and more hustle and bustle. There's more and more activity. There's more and more noise. And in the midst of this noise, in the midst of um, uh, the, even in the temple courtyard, what is the buzz going around? Will Jesus show up? Because by this time, almost everyone has heard of this Jesus, even if they've never seen him. You know, it's kind of like he's the talk of the town, what we might say around here, the talk of the county, but in this, the talk of the nation. And so everybody's buzzing. Is he going to come? Because they know, because maybe there was an edict or whatever by the, by the um, leading Jews, um, put out a th- word that if anybody sees him, let them know immediately. So they know that, a lot of the Jews know that, that um, the Pharisees are not very pleased with Jesus, and so they're wondering, is he going to show up? I mean, he's a male Jew. He's supposed to come to the Passover. When is he going to show up might be the better question. Is he going to show up a week early? Is he going to show up just a few minutes before so he could do the Passover and then skedaddle? When is he going to be here? What time? So they were looking for him. They were questioning. So he was a talk in the temple, for sure. And everybody who was talking was talking about Jesus. Isn't that kind of what Jesus always wants? Sometimes you know that bad talk can at least get you to talk about the right thing. You know, sometimes bad things that happen actually get you to talk about the things you should be talking about. Anybody ever experienced that in their marriage? (laughs) Something went wrong to finally get you to talk about something you needed to a long time ago. So that was what was going on. So even the maybe negative talk was at least getting people to talk about Jesus and at least confront the idea of who is he? Is he truly the Son of God? Is he the Savior of the world? Is he the Messiah? Or is he just another wacko, lunatic? Because that would have been another one of the suggestions. They had maybe three lines of talk would have gone like this. They would have either condemned him or dismissed him would have been their line. Or they would... um, be curious about him. And this is the way people are today, right? And then also, they would have been talking about how much he meant to them. All those conversations, I'm sure, were um, going on. And it's the same thing today. We talk about what's important to us, right? We talk about what we don't like. We talk about what we want to know about. And we talk about what we love. Is that true? It's what we talk about. Everything else, it's like, we don't want anything to do with it. All right, so now we come to our main text this morning, which is in uh, Luke, John chapter 12, I mean. And we're at the idea of extravagant love. Extravagant love. So as we think about this, I just want, I think I'll read down through um, to get the context, and then we'll go back and, and explain it a little more. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. And Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why? Was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Sounds good, right? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with me, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but so that they might also see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Extravagant love. I think Mary is a picture of this extravagant love. We're going to be looking at her for a moment. That's going to be our main text, is um, Mary herself. Every time you see Mary, what do you see her doing? Worshiping, but practically what is she doing? She's always at his feet. She always comes to his feet. And that's, a, that's a, where you got the word worship, I'm sure, was from that idea that, you know, when you're, you're going to give somebody honor, not, I mean, when was the last time you fell down at somebody's feet? Okay, and weren't trying to get your way about something or, 
or weren't trying to say sorry and get him to forgive you quickly. Okay, anyways. But who, when was the last time you fell down at somebody's feet because you reverenced them so much, because you loved them so much, because you honored them so much? You know, we don't typically do that, do we? Even maybe sometimes we should. We don't do that. But often we don't do that even with Jesus. Physically or even in here. We can't come to Jesus bowing at his feet. We come to him and we want to dialogue with him. We want to head to head, you know, intellect to intellect. How's that working for you? Is your intellect up to par with God's? Just curious. But a lot of times we don't really come to him humbly and graciously. So let's look at what, what does extravagant love look like? I want to say just even based on verse 1 and 2, um, you know, Jesus, you know where he's headed. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And what is going to be happening when he gets to Jerusalem, eventually? He's going to be crucified. Do you think Jesus knows that at this point? Yes, he's on his way there on purpose, okay? Keep that in mind. Where does he want to stop by, you could say, on his last visit before he gets to Jerusalem? Friends. His closest friends that we know of in the, in the Bible, I mean other than maybe we could say the disciples, but I mean, friends, look at verse 1. To Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus raised from dead. So they made him a supper there. And Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. He hung out with friends. Extravagant love always comes from a friend. Not from an enemy. Not from a stranger. Because they can't show, they can show acts of love towards you, a stranger can, but extravagant love is not going to come from a stranger. It's going to be, come from a friend. Jesus. Is he your friend? You know, I think of in the Bible, you know, Abraham was called a friend of God. In other words, he had a relationship with God that was personal, meaningful. They could talk back and forth. They could say everything. They trusted each other. A lot of times, I think we come to Jesus not as our closest friend who we want to know everything about us, a lot of times we're trying to pretend he doesn't know things about us. By the way, he knows everything. So whether you're pretending or not, he knows. But a lot of times our attitude is we're going to hide this from God. We're not really going to be open with him. You look in uh, the, and I've probably said this many times in the Psalms, and David is very open with God. He doesn't hide his feelings. He doesn't hide his anger. He doesn't hide his um, concern and, and how he's thinking he's treated misfairly or mis wrong, just unfairly. Let me change that word a little bit. Mistreated. But he talks about, I'm angry with you, Lord. Are you open with God like that? Because he's your friend? Or no, you know, he wouldn't want to know about me. Well, if you're a friend of God, you know he does. Or do you treat God kind of like that um, and, and this isn't really one, but Picture this, like, I, I thought of the closest thing of a genie, you know? You know a genie, you know, like a little uh, lamp thing, and it's gold or brass or something like that. And I kind of picture, you know, that I'm going to rub my little genie, and out the nostrils are going to come my wish. You know, that's, that's kind of the picture I had when I looked at this deer this morning. And so, a lot of times, that's the way we treat God. We're not really a friend of him. We're not really trying to just be in a relationship with him. We're more like, we want to rub him, rub his little tummy, and have our wish come true. It's not a relationship. It's what can I get from Jesus? What is your relationship with Jesus? You know I gave you those pieces of paper. And I hope as we go through this, you can truly evaluate what, how is your relationship. Do you have an extravagant love towards God or not? But at first, it comes from a friend. Are you a friend of Christ? The only way to become a friend of anyone is you have to do what? Meet them. Isn't that simple? No, you can't even spend time with them if you don't meet them. You can spend time with strangers all the time, but if you haven't met them and started dialoguing, you're not going to become a friend. And that's the same thing with Jesus. You can be here. You can listen to things about Jesus. You can um, talk to some higher power somewhere, but until you meet Jesus, until you say, 
I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and I believe that Jesus died for my sin, he buried and he rose again and conquered the grave, and he did it for me, that's when you meet Jesus. That's when you start a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. So first, it starts with being a friend. The question I have for you this morning, are you a friend of Jesus? He wants to be your friend. He wants to have a relationship with you, but he won't force himself on you. Because that wouldn't be much of a friend, would it? If he forced himself. But he's always calling us to become one of his friends. In order for you to ever have extravagant love towards him, you first need to be his friend. They were friends. All right, what do we see here now as a friend and thinking of, of Mary specifically? We're going to see a couple things right here in verse 3. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard. I, I, every time I read that, I think of lard. Okay, that's just what comes to my mind every time. But it's not that. In fact, I'll tell you what it is. Nard is an herb from the Himalayas um, in northern India. So, and it was, and this pound of nard, not lard, represented a year's wages. A whole year's wages. Sometimes this could be used like as a dowry, like for a woman given a dowry. So it could have been her dowry. Maybe if she, uh, we don't know that she was uh, married at this time. It doesn't say anything about that. So it could have been that. But it also could have been for her burial of some day when she was going to die. Somebody might have that. Um, it, could be a, it could represent, for sure, a lifetime of savings. Just so you get a picture of, of how much this means. It's not just a little trinket. It's a serious representation of, of, of money and of, of coming from it. Extravagant love, I think you can see even by this, gives financially. You say, well, that's weird. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. She didn't just say she loved God. She gave, you could say, her life's earnings to him. And we can say, what a waste. She just dumped it on his feet, maybe on his head too. We different ideas on that. And what a waste, and it was gone. But why did she do it? Because she had an ex 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 extravagant love for him. And she was willing to give it all that she had. Reminds me of the widow's mite, right? She, all she had was a mite. But it's all she had, and she gave it to him. Is your love extravagant towards God that you're willing to give financially of what you have? And I hate preaching on finances, and you know that. You never hear those things. But in this context, Mary's love came out of her money. Do you know that we give to what we love? I love food, so what do you think I spend a lot of money on? Pizza? Is that what you like? I like pizza, too. I don't know how much money. If I had put all the money in the bank from when I was like 14 years old that I have spent on Mountain Dew, I would be able to probably have a good, um, what do you call it, retirement fund. Because it would have been drawing interest all these years. And some of you know that. If I'd, probably if I had um, put the money from the Mountain Dew, I gave some of you guys <laughs> over the years. Yeah, Reg, Patrick, yeah, I can think of a few of you. Over the years, you know, I might be able to retire on that too. The point is this. She gave because she loved him. As you, as you look at that paper, it does your giving to church, to a ministry that represents Christ, show that you have an extravagant love for him? That's, what, that's one of those questions on that paper. Because I see with Mary... It showed her love. Because we, we will, are willing to give up financially for what we love most. All right, what else? Mary took a pound of very costly, pure, of very night, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. 
We already talked about that every time we see her, where is she spending her time? At the feet of Jesus. Do you give physically time? The question, the second one is about time. Is about physically. Are you, do you have extravagant love towards Christ and it shows by your time investment? It shows by the amount of time you spend in the Word. It shows by the amount of time you pray and talk to God. Because remember, prayer is not this funny, oh, Lord. you know, it's not that. It's just talking to God, relating with Him. Tell Him your concerns, your struggles, telling Him your praises on what you're happy about. It's just talking to God. It's spending time, like even coming to church or to Bible studies, that time where you're relating with God. Does your time spent with the Lord show that you have an extravagant love for God? This paper is not to pass in, okay, by the way. But God, I think, put it on my mind this morning so that you could be able to evaluate yourself. Where am I at? Is it a one or a five? And Mark, I don't know if he's in the room, twisted it all around, so I don't know what he did. He said he did the opposite of what I asked him. So what is one? Is one the weakest or the strongest? Yeah, see, I told him one is the strongest. But anyways, some people just can't. they got to do it their own way, you know? Mark in the room. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> it doesn't matter which one, of course. But the point is, when you look at that paper, where are you? Evaluate it honestly. Because it's only when we look at ourselves honestly that we can ever grow closer to the Lord. If we keep having these hypotheticals and we say, yeah, I'm pretty good with God, what does that mean, being pretty good with God? You mean, yeah, I have love for God. Well, what does that mean? What does it look like? Are you really there? I mean, maybe you are today, because that can happen too. You can have a high rating, and that's okay. Don't feel guilty about having a high rating, okay? This is just an honest evaluation for you and the Lord. Why? Because He desires a closeness with you. And the more honest you are, then the more you can see maybe where it's lacking so that you can get close to God in those areas. You could say the, the opposite of that would be, or is God something you just fit into your life when it feels convenient? Does reading the Word just... You know, once in a while I get a few moments and I think, oh, why don't I read the Bible? Or you think, oh, oh, I've had a really bad day and I need God today, so I'll talk to him. Or, you know what, I don't have anything better to do, so I'll be in church today. You know, next week I might add something else and I'll, I'll decide to do something different. I'm not saying there's not legitimate things there. This is a self-evaluation for you and God. So please be honest for your own spiritual sake so number one was financial number two is physically but look at this also i want to go down to verse seven when jesus said this to the disciples therefore jesus said let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial for you always have the poor with you but you will not always have me emotionally what I want, I want to explain that just a little bit, what I'm trying to say here. She was in tune with who Jesus was. She could see the sorrow that he was going through. And she understood where he was heading. She understood that he was about ready to go to the cross. He'd said it to everybody, right? He'd said it, we've read it as we've gone through the book of John. He'd been saying ahead of time, yep, someday I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. You're going to put me in the ground, and three days later I'm going to come up. And over and over again, nobody what? Got it. It looks like Mary got it. Extravagant love means emotionally that you care about the person enough that you listen and you understand and you empathize with him. So I believe she was empathizing with his pain of even now going to that cross. Did Jesus feel pain? He's God, but he was also a man. And his humanity... He still felt pain. He felt emotional pain towards those he loved, seeing them in pain. But he also felt pain when he was being tortured physically. And the unique thing I think about Jesus is he would have known the pain he was going to feel before he felt it because he's God and he knows all things. We assume the pain 
and sometimes that's good or bad, but imagine actually knowing exactly what you were going to go through ahead of time and still following through. I think there would have been some sorrow. Some sorrow also in Jesus, knowing that pretty soon, in a, in a maybe a day, the next day, he's going to be walking into Jerusalem, and everybody's going to be going, hooray, hooray, Hosanna. And he knows those same people are going to crucify him six days later. Do you think there was some pain? How is your love for God? Are you emotionally tuned in to what God is trying to tell you? Are you hearing from the Word? Are you convicted of sin? Because you care about what He wants to do in your life. You care about your testimony to other believers. You care about wronging a perfect, holy, loving God who died on the cross for you. And every time you go back to your sin, it's like putting it back in his face. And you don't want to do that. How would you rate yourself? Do you get what Jesus is doing in your life? Another, and I don't mean that you understand every aspect of it, but you get it that he is doing something in your life even when you don't understand it. That even this problem or struggle or whatever you're going through is something that God is trying to do in your life. And you can be thankful even though it may not be a very fun thing to be going through. When you think of it that way and you come to that paper, how are you doing emotionally with you and God? Or you just cold everything he says because you got your ticket to heaven and that's good enough. And you don't care about anything else while he's on earth. All right, well, what, let's, he gives us a pretty good contrast right here, doesn't he? But Judas, <laughs> so we have extravagant love. Now let's see what uh, cheap love looks like. <laughs> but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intended to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Well, that's practical. Isn't it? It's a lot of money. Feed a lot of people for a long period of time. It's practical. Until they say this. Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Cheap love questions the value of extravagant love given to Jesus. Do you see somebody giving to the Lord. Are you questioning why? Why would they do that? Why would they take up all that time to serve Him in that way? Why would they waste time going to church? By the way, if I didn't love God, I would say the same question because I've got many other things I could be doing. How about you? <laughs> no doubt that's a valid question. But if you have an extravagant love for God, the question's different, isn't it? Or the answer is different, I should say. So a cheap love questions the value of extravagant giving to Jesus. And that could be extravagantly financially, physically, emotionally. In fact, I would ask this question in all those, but let's, let's use the financial because that's one we can hold on to a little better. Is anybody in your life wondering why you give the way you do? Whether it be to church or to a ministry. Do you have family members that say, I can't believe you would do that? I've had people say that. Because they don't understand. If people can understand your giving, then probably you're not doing it the way God would want you to. Yeah. People put me down because I never talk about giving, but it's in this one, so I got to. Cheap love is also about this. Selfish but masquerades itself in the practical. You catch that? Selfish, but masquerades itself in the practical. Judas was 100% selfish, but how did, how did he put it off? Oh, but wouldn't it have been a lot more righteous to have used this money for the poor? But in his heart, what was he saying? I'm the one who's poor, give me money. And a lot of times we do that same thing, do we? We try to make it look spiritual when we, when we um, aren't giving to God and make it look very practical. 
If God, and this is where the rubber meets the road, if you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. And this is where you can make it simple for you. If God is calling you to give of your resources, of your time, of your emotions, then you give, period. But for those of you who may not know Christ as your Savior, it's not about just an act. Because once you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside you, and He will guide you as to what is right for you. And the Bible's never about a certain amount of number, a number for money, or a number for time, or a number for how emotionally involved we should be. It's all about how is the Holy Spirit guiding us. And so if you're a believer in Christ this morning, you don't have to worry about, oh, what should it be? God will guide you if you want Him to, if you want Him to, and you let Him. And He will guide you as to what it should be for you when. And for those of you who don't know Christ as your Savior, just think it's not all about more, more, more. It's about being obedient to when you have the Holy Spirit inside you and doing what He asks you to do. And then that's when we'll be blessed. Look at verse, let's finish with the last two verses. The large crowd of Jews learned He was there. They came not for Jesus' sake only. They're not coming just to Jesus anymore. They're coming for His miracles. But that they might see Lazarus, whom He had raised from the dead. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death because people were believing in Jesus because of Lazarus rising from the dead. In the middle, you could say this, in the middle of all this turmoil against Christ, many people are against him, right? Many people are actually looking down on him. But in the middle of this turmoil against Jesus, we see extravagant love exhibited towards him. Guess what? We live in a world that's in turmoil against Jesus. And so when one person shows ex- extravagant love towards him, people take notice. And maybe you came to Christ, one of you here this morning, because you saw extravagant love lived out in somebody else, and you're like, I don't have that. Maybe you're here this morning bec- and you're not saved yet, Because you've seen that lived out in others who have gotten saved, and you say, they've got something I don't have. How do you rate yourself this morning? How are you doing? Going back to that paper, this is our conclusion. Where are you at with those three things on that paper? You could say this. Would somebody be able to convict you in a court of law that you were a Christian because of the way you answered that? Because your, your love for God is extravagant. And it makes a difference in your life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that you'd help each one of us, and, uh, including myself for sure to be honest about where my love is for you. I pray you'd help us to be honest for the sake that we can know maybe where we're lacking so that we can be closer to you tomorrow than we are today. Thank you, Lord, for the love that you showed for us, that extravagant love which we're going to see more and more as we continue throughout the book of John. But it's even pictured here, I think. As you're on your way, we know, to the cross eventually. And yet, are spending time with friends. Taking time for people. And are heading to Jerusalem, even though you knew that they were going to kill you. Greater love is this, and a man laid down his life for his friends. Lord, thank you for being the example of what love looks like, and may we be that back towards you. In Jesus' name.